Hey Internet, this is part two of my talk, Snakes and Ladders and Closure, the Mechanics of Sequential Comic Art. Uh, it's a rather long piece, so there's a full unedited version you can watch on Patreon. That's at patreon.com slash Uh But for the public YouTube feed, I've broken it up into shorter intervals. So there was a part one, and, and there will be a part three. And you can go look for the links for those in the doobly-doo. But for now, let's get on with transitions. So those are all, within the panel, words and picture uh, tra uh, uh, juxtapositions. And then there's the juxtapositions between panels. And there are several kinds. Scott McCloud suggested six. Uh, Jessica Wilmat Maiden added a, uh, a, a seventh. And I'm going to introduce you to a, an eighth that I've named because there wasn't one. It, it, there's a thing that I do in my comics that didn't have a name, so I invented a name for it. And, and that'll come a little later, but I'm going to first show you the seven, including uh, Jessica Nable Matt and Maiden's uh, addition to this list. But the rest of this was initially coined by Scott McCloud in Understanding Comics. So moment to moment, your most basic unit of sequential panel to panel storytelling. Um, it's it's sort of just intervals of time, usually pretty closely matched let, uh, points of time. Uh, they can be further apart moments. Uh, that's entirely possible. Uh, and there's ways of implying, like, for example, notice the differences in gutters in these two examples. The, the first one is, a, is two panels that fill a page, and we're trucking in on someone sleeping. But there's no actual gutter, just a line drawn, and that kind of just feels like a smooth transition. There isn't a strong sense of, of, of a gap of time between the moments. Uh, on the second example, uh, another character from Dream Life, these are both from, from my book Dream Life, is listening to a lecture. And he's not really focusing on it, so at first it's like chicken scratch, and then it turns into ones and zeros, and, and the word balloon just starts crushing him. So there we have our, our word and picture uh, juxtaposition. This is actually abstract text, uh, and it's implying the way the lecture feels. But then we have moment-to-moment -moment transitions that show the passage of time, and there's small gutters between them all. And they're all very consistent, really. These are hand-drawn panels, but I kept the spaces and the gutters very consistent. So the, the passage of time feels very steady and metronomic. Uh, it it's, could be read as being a long time, or it could be read that he's just really impatient and it's a relatively short amount of time before he falls asleep. But either way, it's a, a duration, and uh, it gets across the passage of time. The next transition, oh, there we go, is action to action. That's really similar. It's a close relative to, to moment to moment. But action to action focuses on the action, as is implied. So the examples I have here are all from comics I did. The two on the left are from Sea of Red, and the two on the right are from a uh, short story from Morbius the Living Vampire I did for Marvel Comics a while back uh, called Drainage System. Uh, the Sea of Red panels, uh, the first one is, is kind of a hybrid. It's definitely moment to moment as well. So the ship passes moves away as the uh, character slowly sinks um, but the focus is on two changing actions so I would say this one kind of bridges the, the two kinds of transitions it's also action to action it's about changing events and the drama building as he goes down the bubbles come up but the second one is very action to action so it the camera angles change the exact rhythm in terms of intervals of time passing uh, could be different or, I would say, accelerating. Uh, a vampire bites his neck. Uh, in a panic, he reaches out, grabs a sword, and then manages to slice off his head, the vampire's head. Um, it, the am angles changed wildly to help uh, augment and dramatize the action. And so that's a strong example of action to action. Uh, the Morbius panels are very similar, but I think I've made my point. It's, it's all about... Uh, uh, Varying degrees of focusing on events, so the camera angles will move more in action to action, and the, it, it's often more dramatic. We see a lot of that in American comics and action comics, so action to action for action comics. Subject to subject is a, a very common uh, narrative when you have uh, quieter moments and talking heads, as the term goes, and interactions between people. So the big set of panels we have here are at the bottom of the page we're going to see again in a minute. Uh, we see one character, Leslie, as she takes a bite of something, and then she talks to her friend Dan and says, I worry about you sometimes. Thanks, Doc, for your unbiased perspective. That shift from Leslie to Dan is subject to subject. So she's a subject, and then he's a subject. In the smaller page, you see the whole page there, uh, Gary is at a bar trying to have a, a, a 
peaceful meal with Edith's burger while a barfly kind of hits on him and her, and her boyfriend in the background is looking on. Uh, he kind of blows her off like, you know, I know one thing I don't want to do is not just talk to flirty barflies. So he gets mad and walks off and gives her boyfriend the finger and her boyfriend scowls and Gary goes about trying to eat his burger. Blissfully unaware, probably not really, but trying to be blissfully unaware that trouble's coming. Uh, so those are all subject to subject. We go from Gary and the barfly to the barfly and the bartender to the barfly walking off and Gary cropped off in the third panel. Cut to an angle where we can see the boyfriend and the barfly interacting, close on the boyfriend, close on Gary. Those are all subject to subject transitions. Scene to scene. Now, anytime you have a scene, you're cutting between two moments in time and space. So you're transitioning from one moment and one location to a, a dramatically different moment in time and a different location. Uh, so a large moment amount of time has, has passed and you've moved somewhere else. So the first page here, both these pages are for uh, Wonder Woman vs. the Red Menace. It's a book I did for DC a while back. And it's about an uh, actress who plays Wonder Woman in Hollywood serials during the time of the uh, uh, Red Menace, or, or, or sorry, the, the, the Communist Scare and the blacklisting in Hollywood. And the first three panels there, a, a film writer is being interrogated about attending meetings and he's getting very nervous and you're seeing what are basically all, I would say, uh, subject to subject shots, uh, or you could say action to action shots maybe, uh, as he discusses with his lawyer and gets asked questions and sweats. Then we have a big gap, you notice that large gutter, and we cut to the Hollywood sign and a car in the foreground driving by, and then we cut to a, a big old California style house as a woman leaves a pair of matching cars to go into the house. So that's our starlet and we have two scene-to-scene -scene cuts there, so uh, I'm going to say they're subject to subject to subject to scene to scene for that page. And that gives us a sense of we're jumping from the intense moment and the interrogation. There's a, a big jump of space and time, so there's a wider gutter to help imply more space and time. And then we have a broad cinematic panel with a Hollywood sign, and then another cut that's technically another scene because we're in a different location to the house. And a, and a small panel, a small gutter, because that's not such a big a jump in time and space. We just traveled with her. The next page, our writer friend is drunk, and this is definitely action to action to action for the first three. He's drunk, he's gesturing and yelling. He knocks over some drinks and then becomes self-conscious. And and our our starlet and her boyfriend and some of their friends look on and go, oh, well, it looks like it's time for Stefan to go home. Um, cut to scene outside. They're getting him into the car, cut to scene at the top of his stairs, cut to scene, tucking him into bed. So action to action to action to scene to scene to scene. And so I think you're starting to see that well, a lot of these different transitions are about setting rhythms and pacings and beats and picking how much space and time and how much goes in. Also notice that they have varying different numbers of word balloons, uh, usually not more than two, maybe three or four. It depends. Uh, most of the time, two or one. And that has a lot to do with how much information you can pack into in a moment in a panel. Uh, basically, one, one word balloon should be one idea. It might take more words or less words to get across, but it really shouldn't try to cover more than one idea at a time. And then you can have a response to that idea. And then depending on how big the panel is and how everything works, you could have a response to the response and a comeback, but it's starting to get a little bit crowded if you do that too many times. You want to keep that under control and save like the last panel here where there are actual uh, four panel, four balloons, so three reactions to a first statement. Uh, they're having an interaction as Stefan falls asleep. You want to keep that kind of thing to a minimum. On the whole, a lot of these more intense ones have two, and many have just one that, that sort of carry one idea. And of course, sometimes have some that are wordless, like the bottom of the first page there, just showing us a moment. We don't always have to fill everything with dialogue. So aspect to aspect is one of my favorite kinds of transition styles. Uh, I use it to set ambience and atmosphere a lot, and I think it's one of its greatest strengths. So we have this first page is from Dream Life, uh, and we're outside of the... Uh, um, uh, oh, blanking on its name. It's a diner in Toronto that I go used to go to a lot, uh, less so much these days because it's gotten kind of renovated and, and fancy. Uh, down on... Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Dundas, I believe. Yes, Dundas and near Ossington. Uh, the Lakeview, the Lakeview Diner, that's it. And we're hearing the, the dialogue of our characters inside the diner while we're outside the street. So, huh? And the response, dealing, uh, doing crazy shit like last night. 
we cut to inside, long shot looking up at the window, and we can see one character in the booth. Have you ever uh, wanted to just walk away from it all? And from around the corner, I don't know, uh, Leslie, I'm not really thought about it. And then fork digging into food, she takes a bite of food, and I worry about you sometimes. Thanks, Doc, for your unbiased uh, perspective. So this is those panels we saw, and now we're seeing the larger context. We have aspect to aspect to aspect to subject to subject. So it's slow with aspect to aspect. As we drift around, taking in the environment, we see what she does. And in some ways, actually, we could say is that, that so we have aspect, aspect to aspect to action. So between the fork and the fork going in our mouth is technically an action to action transition. And then we go subject to subject. Um, and notice how these different kinds of transitions have different rhythms. It, it kind of shifts the mood and helps you move into the moment. This other scene here is with Gary Greenberg from Dream Life as well. He goes into the woods carrying a box and a shovel. He looks around the woods. We take in the environment over his head. We see the box under his arm. We see his kind of relaxed, happy face as he enjoys the environment and a bird's singing in the tree as a, a, a woodpecker. Uh, or no, or is it a robin? I think I drew a robin. I can't remember now if I drew a robin or a woodpecker. At any rate, bird singing. That was the connotation meant to be there. Um, all aspect to aspect, aspect to aspect to aspect to aspect. Uh, very good at setting kind of an environmental, ambient sensation about things. Symbolic's really interesting. So this is basically a form of symbolism. Uh, look up symbolism for the art movement. Uh, Klimt was a, a part of the symbolist movement. But symbolism in general uh, is about kind of using abstraction and uh, symbolic visuals to uh, carry ideas. And in comics, in this case, I, this is for a book a story I did for the, called The Rise and Fall, Fall of It All. Um, it's uh, a story about a man who becomes homeless after a series of unre unsatisfying jobs. And the first page here is already symbolic in nature. The, the last time I worked there, they gave me the window. They gave me the cube with the view. And we see a, a large aerial city view and a blue floating cube floating above it and the guy working in the cube. And then we cut to, this would be a, as a page turn, so we turn to the next page and reveal a cube in a dark space. And the first two balloons read, I asked for it when they called me back, but they said, forget it, forget the window. So we get an idea about how the job dropped in quality. His, his work experience was lessened, and it's all in symbolic and value. I think it's pretty effective. Uh, they're technically a page-to-page -page transition here, because I haven't really used this a lot from panel to panel. So here's some examples from uh, Jessica Abel and Matt Maiden's book uh, that are really good. The first one, I believe, is drawn by uh, Matt. The others are definitely uh, Jessica Abel's work. Uh, so we have a person tripping and a broken egg. That's beautiful. It's perfect, right? It's a very symbolic idea of what happens next. Uh, then we have first a symbolic image of the person saying, oh yeah, you'll buy me a yacht too. And then the, the, the dream in her bikini goes poof, and it's not going to happen. Uh, the other two panels, uh, I think it's from Art Babe. Looks like Jessica Abel's old Art Babe comic. And we have a, a pair of women in a car talking. The, the one in the passenger seat is discussing about how she's feeling and, uh, and her emotional state at the moment. And when her friend asks her, how, do you, she, how does she mean, her response is, I feel like I'm burning. And we just get this panel of fires coming out of her chest and out of her eyes. And it's a really effective symbolic transition that communicates the subtext of her emotional state um, with a, a graphic representation. So those are symbolic transitions. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They add magic, uh, magic realism and surrealism to your storytelling. It allows you, even when you're doing a, a fairly uh, human, uh, uns you know, not superheroes, the fantastic, you're doing a very human story, a drama story, you're able to still introduce a, a lot of interesting magical imagery and playfulness to your storytelling using symbolic transitions. Non sequiturs are interesting, and so uh, this is the one that Jessica and Matt suggested in their book to be added to the list. And I thought it was really interesting because I think the, the thing that they're most powerful is as a teaching device and a writing tool. You can totally do it to create comics, but what you're doing is sort of doing a kind of abstract 
comic, uh, cu cut-up, basically. So cut-ups were writing exercises, like William Burroughs would write using cut-ups, and uh, David Bowie wrote a lot of his song using cut-ups. You just take chunks of text and or cut them out of books and magazines or wherever, little strips of text or single words, and rearrange them until you get something interesting. Uh, fridge magnet poetry is kind of a, a cut-up exercise. In this case, I've taken random panels from four different comics that I did. So there's the rise and fall of it all, therefore repent, misplaced, and planet of the apes is all in this one thing. But I put them together like they were one story. I took some care to make sure that there was some flow, so the, the panels kind of read together like they're unified. And then the readers will impose a narrative. They'll read something into it, even though I didn't really have a plan. I just randomly selected the panels, and then the only curating I did was in the layout to make it appealing and kind of have a nice flow and read. Um, to just sort of illustrate how, without my coming up with a story, if I just put this out there somewhere and ask people to write a story for it, people will. And this is what happens if you show people images and don't write text. They will fill in the blanks. So these are two different narratives offered by folks online. Uh, so the first one is, the shit is hitting the fan. No matter your schedule, your inner conflict, or your outer struggle, the shit is going to hit the fan. And then the second one is, the last living descendant of Hermanus' Bosch was having an existential crisis. His job as a mechanical mechanic seemed so meaningless, but he hadn't inherited his great-great-great-great-great-great-etc-grandfather's talent for painting. And then the war began. <laughs> that was a fun one. I like both of those. And I think they really illustrate well the idea that you know, if you just provide some image cues, people will fill in the blanks. Now, as a, a fun game and to, to illustrate... Uh, how juxtaposition works. This is an excellent tool. I think it's also potentially a really interesting thing to use for uh, if you're in a class or you're just yourself and you're teaching students about this or if yourself you're stuck for writing ideas to have uh, a bunch of images. So one thing I did for the exercise today when I was doing this presentation of this class is I cut up a bunch of Nancy and Calvin and Hobbes comics into just single individual panels and threw them out in a big pile loosely on the table, and I invite people to sort of co select them and put them together and invent stories with them. And uh, so that's an exercise I recommend to you. It's it's kind of like a suspect devices, which is a, 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 a Nancy exercise. Um, and uh, I'll I'll throw up a picture of an example of one done by a student here. And uh, th this is a uh, something that is a really great way to kind of play with and uh, experiment with storytelling without having to get involved, invested in write, uh, draw, a lot of drawing. But it's also a great way, say you're stuck for a writing idea, uh, just playing with cut-ups is a great way to cue your imagination. Um, I think it's a good example of a thing where when we're trying to be looking at the blank page and we're stuck and we can't think of something, uh, often we're stymied by our own sense of inadequacy and not knowing where to start. So like one thing I would recommend is just write anything because it's easier to react to something and edit than it is to just invent and expect it to be masterful the first time. It's, it's often not, but once you have something, you can hone it and, cue, and, and, and clarify it and make it better. Uh, but doing something like this with just cut up panels and playing with and inventing an idea, you can then go and redraw and make it your own, If even if you use a, a classic newspaper strip. Um, but it can still help you uh, think of things that you wouldn't have otherwise because there's a great example of like if you give someone a, a puzzle to solve uh, and ask them like so how many ways can you uh, unlock this thing with this candle or something like that or how many things can you do with a brick as a great example that's one of them that was actually done and then people will list like 20 different things they could do with a brick and then you tell them to imagine there's someone with more imagination. So you can say uh, a hippie stoned on LSD or an artist or you know some, someone who's inherently creative. Whether this person is or isn't a creative person, imagining themselves as that person, their lists will double sometimes. They certainly get more ideas than just the original 20. And it's a lot of it's down to this permission you give yourself to have creative ideas. Sometimes we get in our own way. So I think non sequiturs and things like cut up you know, cutting up comic panels and play, rearranging them. It's just a, a way to give yourself permission to invent ideas by bouncing off of something it is an excellent tool. And it also just illustrates the power of juxtaposition. Anytime you put images together, people will infer meaning between them, and there will be a moment of closure between those panels. Um, the question is how much you control it, and then even how much do you want to control it, and how much do you want to let your readers uh, infer. So, here's an example of a comic strip. This is from Matt and Jessica's book again.
And it's just about picking your moments and showing how the different beats work and, and moments uh, and juxtapositions and, and closure work. So here we have a, a simple comic. Guy's about to take a bite. He takes a bite. Chomp. Girl runs in and says, don't eat that. He reaction shot. Why not? And the girl says, it's Adam's apple. And he's antics and the apple is up in the air. And that's got a pretty even beat. It's, it's So the rhythm to that is like, da, 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 da. Uh, you could sort of read it with the text as about to eat. Chomp, don't eat that. So that's sort of two. Why not? It's one. And then it's Adam's apple on an antic. So it's da, 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 da. Either way, it's kind of very symmetrical and, and even. Uh, it's a bit metronomic. It's not bad, but you could change up the rhythm. And, you know, good comedy is all about delivery and timing, really, more than what's said. It's about surprise and about uh, a fun, playful rhythm. And sometimes it's about being snappy. So what happens when we go to three panels. So now we got our two middle moments are in one panel. There's still moments, but they've gotten moved together closely now, so there are a quick beat, cut pair of beats. Um, so now we got da, da 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 And see, so it's starting to sound like ching, rim shot. And that's what you're looking for with comedy. You're looking for that fast, right? And that's what we're getting here. We're now becoming, we're upping the humor level by changing the rhythm picking our moments and changing the juxtaposition and word and picture uh, juxtaposition and the, and the frame to frame juxtaposition. Uh, we have fewer moments of closure, so it's more on the page, uh, but what's on the page is got to us much quicker. Uh, so the speed of, of the humor and the comedy works. We could add more beats. It's questionable whether this is funny, but it does have a kind of silly slapstick feel about it. So guys, but hey, bite, don't eat that. Why not? Don't you know? Cough, cough. It's Adam's apple, whoop, and he bounces out of the panel. Not just a little antic, he bounces right out. So now it's slapstick. That can kind of work. It's longer. Uh, it has more beats to it. But it's working. So you can go too far with this. Here's two examples. Uh, you could show too many moments. Guy's hungry. Oh, as an animal. Oh, no. It, it, and we're running out of room. There's no room for the punchline. Ha ha. That's sort of a meta joke, and it's kind of funny in that sense. But you can see how, as far as the comic that they were trying to do goes, too much. Uh, and then you can do too little and sort of step on your own coattails. So, guys, take a bite. Don't eat that. Why not? It's out of that bowl. And there's no surprise. It's all there. So, picking your moments and finding the right rhythm and the right kind of juxtaposition to have between your words and your pictures and between your panels really important to effective storytelling with comics. Okay, that's it for part two of Snakes, Ladders, and Closure, the mechanics of comics art. Um, uh, part three is coming up next. I'm going to talk about flow. Uh, if you want to watch the full uncut version of this, go to patreon.com slash salgood and you will find it there. And consider pledging. Uh, become uh, just a Patreon subscriber and get my comics. Or there are higher tiers, including becoming a student Patreon, with which you can send me your work and get personalized feedback and tutelage. In the doobly doo, you will find links and credits to all the sources and material that I use in these clips. And uh, I hope you enjoy. Stick around for part three. Look for the link in the doobly doo. And don't forget to hit subscribe so that you can get all my videos as soon as I post them.